Hi, and welcome to the OWASP webcast series. My name is Fabio Cirulo, and today I have the pleasure to be with Glenton Kate from the Netherlands. He's the project lead for the OWASP security knowledge framework along with his brother Ricardo. And in the next hour, we're going to look at their project goals, next milestones, and we'll also delve into some of the best practices used to develop this project. Things like continuous integration, maintaining a well-test code base, performing static and dynamic analysis, and even using a scrum board to track all these activities. So I really hope you enjoyed this session. It's over to you, Glenn. Thank you very much, Fabio, for having me here. And uh, well, tell about uh, the whole security knowledge framework and uh, the de development life cycle of it. Um, so yeah, first of all, uh, Hi all, I'm Glenn Tenkate. I'm uh, one of the project leaders of the OL Security Knowledge Framework. Uh, I created this uh, project together with my brother, uh, Ricardo Tenkate. Um, yeah, and I want to uh, go through today, uh, yeah, under the hood, how is Security Knowledge Framework being built and uh, being developed? And also, yeah, of course, want to give a, a demonstration about uh, the Security Knowledge Framework and how you can use it in your own projects. Um, so yeah, first uh, I would say let's start with uh, the wiki page and uh, a small, uh, well, introduction. Um, Excellent. For this I uh, will share my, uh, my screen. So over here, as you can see, we have set up uh, uh, an, um, a fully, yeah, documentation of, uh, yeah, the whole project. So basically, the introduction to the installation steps and the first runs, uh, yeah, to help you, uh, yeah, to see how you can use this framework and um, use it properly. Um, so, well, to start with an introduction, um, the security knowledge framework has been created by me and my brother because, uh, yeah, we really saw the need for it. It was also um, very hard to do security right, of course. And there are a lot of, uh, well, uh, documents available out there uh, to guide and help a developer. Uh, but we thought it was still a little bit uh, thin. Um, so yeah, we decided to create a whole framework around knowledge. Um, and yeah, that, that's basically what we did with the security knowledge framework. Um, the funny thing is, uh, first of all, I want to start with, yeah, the development of uh, the, the framework itself. Um, because uh, as you maybe already know, the Security Knowledge Framework is a project we started almost a year ago. Um, and in the first yeah, test run, uh, the test project of the Security Knowledge Framework, we decided to, to just build it in PHP with a MySQL database and yeah, just develop it on our own. Um, but yeah, we found out that it had pretty much limitations because uh, there wasn't any unit testing in, there wasn't any yeah, automatic build street building uh, the project and verifying it. Um, so we had uh, a lot of issues developing um, yeah, the initial uh, security knowledge framework. Right. Um, that would uh, also be a very uh, an hassle for other people to add content or contribute to our project, right? Because they yeah, also have the hassle of you know, breaking stuff and, you know, no unit testing. So, um, yeah, before we really wanted to uh, put any more content in security knowledge framework, my brother and I decided to rewrite the whole project and really, um, well, doing it right, having a full development life cycle uh, that really helps us and uh, deliver better quality and better code. Uh, also, for the people that want to contribute and uh, want to add content, uh, they also have now the ability and, you know, the, the, the positive feedback of those uh, build suite tooling that you can set up in your software development lifecycle. So, 
Yeah, so before we start um, um, showing and giving a demo about the security knowledge framework, I, I first want to dive into the more technical stuff and, well, how the security knowledge framework has been set up and, uh, yeah, with what type of means, right, with what tooling and what mindset. Um, so when you visit the, the GitHub page of uh, the security knowledge framework, uh, in here, you can see that we have a, a, a couple of project status details. As yes. you can see over here, you have a, a badge saying build passing. You have a badge saying coverage 99%. And you have a badge scrutinizer that gives you a mark, uh, in this case, uh, 8.03. Uh, we also have a, a badge for the SSL config. Um, but yeah, that's, that's not really relevant for now. Let's focus on the first three. Um, okay. So to give you an example of uh, what those badges are, um, let, let's have zoom in on them first, what it exactly is, right? Sure. Um, so for example, you have the Travis badge. Um, well, that points out to this Travis URL location you're seeing here. And in here, I defined uh, with Travis a service you can uh, uh, use for your open source projects. Um, and in here, you can, um, well, define which source code and which project you're working on, uh, which type of um, uh, requirements the project has to, uh, you know, be available on the system. Uh, right. It then, you know, tries to install the new source code that it has seen changed on the GitHub. So mm -hmm. every time there is a GitHub change, Travis will see this and will continue and, you know, trigger the build again. Uh, will include the new source code that uh, the person has added and try to, well, in this case, compile and run the Python uh, package. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, when that's all correctly being done, it will run also the Python test uh, unit testing uh, cases. And in this uh, specific unit test, we have uh, 10 items that it will, will be tested. Uh, yeah, uh, also in the Travis run, that will give us back the overview of how many test coverage there was and how many unit tests has yeah, passed or failed. Um, in this case, the, we had 10 passed uh, uh, unit tests that took like 12.75 seconds. Um, <clears throat> and after that, uh, the Travis will run the coveralls uh, command and will push the, yeah, the new results about the unit testing to the coveralls uh, service. Um, well, that brings us automatically to the, the second batch, um, this batch, the coverage, 99%. Um, <clears throat> as you can see here, this is the, the service uh, dashboard of the coveralls uh, service. And here you can find for every uh, yeah, push that has been done to the GitHub, uh, the, cover the amount of coverage that has been uh, yeah, met and, and, you know, uh, the result of the coverage from the commitment. So right. that means if, if some, some user would um, yeah, break one of the unit testing, you would immediately see that the coverage will drop down to another percentage. Right. So for me, uh, as a, yeah, the project leader to guide people and contributors to add you know, high quality uh, content and code, I can see immediately after a, a push, in what state the code is. Uh, because yeah, if it's already failing the build, something terribly has gone wrong. So there must be a, a syntax error somewhere in the Python code. Or if they failed the unit test, then sometimes the logic of the application has changed. So that also gives an indication where the error is and how to you know, uh, debug it and resolve it. So it, it saves already a lot of time. Um, well, and those, when, are, when those, those, those are the badges that you show back in your GitHub page, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, basically, you have a fully detailed overview of all the jobs, um, but the badge is just a, a, a quick yeah, overview of if it's good or not, right? Yes. Um, and, and when you want the really the detailed stuff, the in-depth stuff, well, you can go to your servers, do your project, and really see well, all the, the detailed stuff on, you know, what the output was of the, the, the servers. And the same way for the coveralls uh, testing, unit testing. Per uh, push or commit, you can see the outcome of the unit test 
and uh, well, based on the result, you can already see, you know, and pinpoint the issue that probably uh, is there. Um, That's amazing. So you, you have continuous integration, you have uh, unit testing, um, That's and everything is integrated into your project. So it's That's not only correct. just creating a project, but you are actually following like a secure development, you know, life cycle <laughs> <laughs> all along. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly true. Um, so yeah, there is even a, a third uh, um, service that we're also using, and that's also a very nice one to give an, a, a fast overview, and that's called the Scrutinizer. So right. basically what Scrutinizer is, that's a service where you can, uh, it will analyze your code. It's not really analyzing your code on security issues, but more on practical uh, um, yeah, rules. Like if you have duplication in your code or dead end code or uh, you know, based on if you have like uh, 20 if else statements in one function, then the complexity of that function goes up. And that okay. means that it is harder to maintain, uh, more, uh, yeah, more possible that errors can you know, uh, happen in there and aren't really um, handled correctly. Um, so that also rates your code, meaning um, it's hard to maintain. So it will get a bad, uh, yeah, great, right? So yeah. with, with so this... Uh, this is more like quality assurance. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And, and getting the feedback of when, well, when you have sloppy code or duplication code, it will give you the heads up already um, by analyzing it uh, all in an automated fashion, right? Right. Uh, and and the, are these sort of um, the tools that you are mentioning, are these open source? Are they free to use for any sort of OWASP project leader? Yes. Um, the cool thing is that all the services I'm uh, currently using, so the, the Travis, the coveralls, the scrutinizer, code quality checking, they are all free to use when you have an open source project. So um, for every uh, OWASP project out there and that want also the, well, the whole continuous integration part, um, yeah, can, uh, you know, get a service from them and uh, they will, yeah, support uh, open source projects. So that's really cool from, uh, from all the, the companies. Um, right. Yeah, to, to, to just give this and uh, even for the open source projects to, yeah, give the, the good bang, right? The <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But any, anyone could just go to Travis or Coverells or Scrutinizer, configure yeah. his project or you know her project, exactly. and just um, use it straight away. Yes, that's correct. For Travis, for example, you do need to have a, well, in this case, a, a .travis .yaml file. Okay. Um, but in here, you have a well, a simple um, steps of installation or yeah, how you would normally install or create your application, right? And right. basically in here you just define, well, uh, what type of language, uh, which version of Python, uh, because yeah, it can also do multiple versions, so you don't really have to test on one specific version, but you know, you can do multiple. Yeah. Um, and then basically, well, all the installation uh, commandos, uh, well, we made a, uh, also, an improvement we did in the past is because it's now all Python, we also made a pip package of it. Um, so yeah, that's also very easily to install and you know use the security knowledge framework. And also that really helps on, well, uh, your whole continuous integration and the ease of, of installation for other people, right? Right. Because uh, yeah, that, that should also be as flawless uh, as possible. Um, Basically, then we have a, a script section where we run the specific uh, uh, scripts that are needed. So in this case, the setup to test if it's still able to, uh, well, to run the, the setup of the security knowledge framework. And we're also running the, the test, uh, unit testing of the security uh, framework. And as I mentioned before, then we have an after script that uh, does the coverage run to get the, the, the metrics uh, for the coveralls testing. And after the success, we run the coveralls, and that will push the uh, the results of the unit testing to the coveralls. Um, and so, what what a normal um, uh, yes yeah, cycle would look like, right? That is, um, 
um, well, I, I would create a, a fork out of this project, then I have my own fork and my own GitHub uh, uh, space. From there, I create the, yeah, the new functionality or, you know, add or modify the content. Um, on the moment I made a push back to my own GitHub, uh, yeah, in the fork, the Travis yeah. will see it and will also pick up the build. So this is when you you want to add or contribute to the security knowledge framework, uh, and when you fork it in your GitHub, you have all the benefits. Uh, yeah, that we also have right for the project. Right. So when you do a Git uh, pull or Git commit, it will automatically trigger the Travis and trigger the unit testing and trigger the code quality. That would take around two three minutes, and then give the the contributor yeah feedback on the build state on the unit testing phase and also on the, the code quality. Um, so, and, and, and the, the idea is if that's all, you know, good, uh, it's all green, it's not the code when the code quality uh, didn't went down, stuff like that, well, then we can, you know, uh, accept the pull request and merge it with uh, the master uh, GitHub. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, in the whole process, you also have, uh, well, the 4i principle, uh, <laughs> Uh, thing so yeah it's a, a full blown uh, software development cycle and of course um, it it gives also room for another two important things and that could be the the well the static analyzers or the dynamic uh, analyzers yes. um, tooling like uh, the OWASP uh, ZOP uh, proxy absolutely uh, yeah. yeah that can be easily added in this uh, continuous integration uh, yeah the problem is that you don't really have a service of it uh, that's running uh, online, but um, also you well, that, that will happen soon. I know yeah. that Simon Bennett is planning uh, on deploying that. So that yeah. would be awesome because then you have an, an extra step in your whole software development lifecycle where you can boot up and spin up the application and use the Zap service to also test it for the DOST uh, step, right? Yep. So um, yeah. So yeah, basically that is uh, yeah the security knowledge framework, um, the the whole development life cycle. Also an interesting uh, thing to mention: um, all the 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 content that you are seeing. So all the knowledge base items, all the code examples, they are all based on uh, markdown files and format. Um, so again, that's also something we uh, really decided on um, splitting those things up. And make okay. it easier for people, well, to contribute. To contribute. And, uh, yeah. Right. yeah, exactly, and add content. Um, right. So yeah, for example, here you have the code examples. I can click one open. How it will look like? Mm -hmm. um, well, basically, it's just Markdown format. And if you uh, uh, follow the rules of uh, Markdown, it will uh, render it uh, perfectly in the, the security knowledge framework. Right. So that's great. So any anyone could contribute to the project. It's just Basically, you know, getting into GitHub and start coding away. Exactly, yeah. And uh, it will automatically give you feedback. Um, yeah, and the stuff that's really hard or, you know, you can't get your mind around it. Um, yeah, <laughs> we also uh, have the, the support um, uh, uh, section in the readme.io website. Uh, right. Again, readme uh, is also a service uh, that provides a uh, free space um, yeah, for open source projects to really, well, put really nice documentation and styling and, uh, well, they also have a, a nice support uh, function where me people can ask questions and you can debate about, well, certain discussions, right? Right, like a forum, yes. Yeah, yeah, and it's all already included on the documentation, so, uh, and in the documentation page, so that's really nice, uh, again, a nice service to really um, you know, match everything up. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and of course, uh, like you said before a little bit, um, the whole thing of, of the security knowledge framework and why we use the whole software development lifecycle is because, yeah, that, that's really, you know, it gives so much benefits to, well, uh, me, to other people. Um, it, it takes really a lot of time away from me that I would normally spend, yeah, manually testing it. And also, well, on a poor way, because sometimes you forget the thing to test, and absolutely, you know yeah. how it goes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what we also do is, uh, yeah, really using the, the DevOps mindset, 
you know, the whole continuous integration yeah. testing <laughs> and, uh, yeah. well, using a scrum awesome. board. Yeah. 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 For example, we also have uh, over here, we have the scrum board. And that's also nice to, uh, to give an, uh, to show it because uh, what this service does, and again, it's all free services. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, have a look on the, the GitHub. Uh, what this does is taking all the, the items we created on the GitHub and we'll display them in a scrum manner. So um, in here, you can see that me and my brother are currently writing .NET code examples. I'm <laughs> writing the Python examples and we create more, uh, creating more pre-development uh, items. Um, so those are the items uh, yeah, in progress. And on the left, we have the backlog items with all the, the stuff we, uh, do, we yeah, want to pick up and uh, improve. So for example, if I'm a new contributor and I don't know where to start, I will go into the Scrum board and look at the backlog and say, oh, actually, I could help Glenn on this topic. Exactly, yeah, that would be great. And then you can also, um, well, assign them to you, uh, put them in progress, and, and yeah, me and my brother will keep having the overview of who's doing what, and well, that, that makes it a lot easier, right, to, to have it, and um, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, well, it is awesome, it is awesome. I, I, I'm really impressed with the quality of, of the project. Um, like, show me the, the actual, let, let's go over the, the actual project and yes. let's, let's look at like a demo of the project. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, another cool thing, because we have the whole automation and continuous integration, um, we do put uh, the, the live, uh, yeah, the, the newest code that isn't really released yet, but is in master um, of, of the GitHub. We do put it on the, the demo uh, security knowledge framework .org, uh, right. and we run and test it there. So this is exactly uh, yeah a clone now that's continuous integration being uh, deployed on the production server uh, where people can use the demo and test them uh, themselves. Right. Um, so yeah, it's funny to mention that 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 is you know, uh, exactly from uh, the master uh, repo and uh, we, we push it every time there is a change. Yes. Um, so that's also uh, a cool benefit when you have automated all, everything and yeah. Oh, definitely, yes, yes, absolutely. I, what, what you're showing us like before is the actual under the hood. Of, exactly. Of, of the project. And, yeah, and, of this project. And, now, and now we're seeing the actual front end of the application. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. So I now logged into the the web application of the the security knowledge framework. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, this is a framework you can run uh, well as a service inside your company, or you can run it just locally on your machine. Uh, yeah, to to give you guidance and help you, uh, because yeah, that's basically what what the security knowledge framework is all about. Um, it, it has like four core principles. Uh, I, I would always mention it. Um, that is basically, well, the first is the ASVS checklist and the security requirement. And ASVS is really, um, yeah, an, another, by the way, another project from OWASP um, that's really, you know, uh, yeah, how you call it? It's really yeah, hitting the, the spot, right? Security verification standard. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, to, to really understand the security knowledge framework, um, yeah, you, you, I would say use it as a security requirement. Um, so let me, maybe I should start over because that is not, uh, you know, the correct way to say it. Um, okay. So we could stop, Glenn, we could stop and yeah. start from scratch. So don't worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, because it felt a little, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's OK. It's OK. It's OK. I think we, we could start with, uh, you know, now, now that you're showing this screen here, yeah. we could start like with a, an intro about this screen and how you tie your project with uh, ASVS. Yeah. Yeah. OK, check. Um, because that will uh, get. You know, you, you, I can explain that when we are at the post-development phase, because yeah, that that's really using the ASVS and 
Yes. Um, so maybe I should start this the, the, with this page saying, well, first, you know, it's important that you have security requirements. Um, so yeah, I, I want to focus and start with that, and then go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I now logged into the security knowledge framework. And uh, the page you're seeing right now, that is the, the dashboard, the landing page. Um, from here, you can start your new project, edit an existing project, or just use the, the security knowledge base or the code examples as a reference for you know, how to implement a specific uh, functionality or how to mitigate specific uh, attack factors. Right. Um, to give a, a small overview of uh, the knowledge base items, um, those are items that are being used in the security knowledge framework. As I said before, it is used as a reference for the developer. So if he wants to in, uh, implement, the, well, for example, the strict transport security headers, we have here in the knowledge base an item about it that uh, first gives a description of what it is and how an attacker can abuse this. And um, yeah, what the risk is, when a developer is not taking this into account. Uh, right. Then we have a, a small solution where we tell the developer, uh, well, how to mitigate this attack factor properly uh, and defend his application against this attack factor. Right. Uh, we also found out that the knowledge base items are really you know, about um, creating the awareness and, and giving the, the knowledge about you know, what the attack factor is. Um, but again, it is uh, very limited. I mean, um, security is all about details. It's all about the details. And one minor detail can, well, screw your application up and, and becomes, you know, uh, uh, vulnerable to, to attack. Um, so we also decided to create code examples. Um, the code examples were busy in, uh, well, we have the code examples in the language PHP and .NET already. And uh, well, I and my brother and other people are also working on Java code examples, uh, Python code examples. So those will be added uh, uh, later also. Um, but yeah, to, to give you an, uh, an, uh, an example of, for example, the file upload functionality. Right. Here, you can see uh, how uh, we would create a file upload function. Um, normally, in PHP, you can do this with uh, three lines of code, right? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it, the, the issue then is that it isn't really secure. So in the code examples, the idea is that we take the developer and we go step by step through the code and explaining all the mitigation steps, the, you know, why we are doing this. Um, so for example, what we're doing here is first input validation. Always first input validation, you know, and just continue. Over here, you see that we do a sort of a count, and the count is for seeing if the, the attacker has abused the functionality or not. So if the right. input validation would trigger an error, then we raise the counting. And when the counting has uh, set to a certain treasure hold and it passed the, that, that magic number, uh, the application will kick the user out, destroy a session, and deny access to the application. So right. that means that the application will have a sort of a defensible and, uh, approach and will sh shut down the user when he's yeah, abusing the functionality. Right. Um, well, and as you can see here, we're really going uh, through step for step, giving uh, the comments uh, about why and how um, yeah, and, and I believe this class only is uh, around 150 lines of code to properly, uh, yeah, do input uh, handling on, on file uploads. Uh, Perfect. So, yeah. so it's more like um, an instructional sort of example. Like you, you will learn how to implement a file upload functionality in your application. Uh, exactly. And I imagine there are hundreds of examples available there in the in the knowledge framework that is true yeah for for the most common functionality that you will use in your application we have yeah. created code examples for it so you really can see in detail on yeah how to properly defend your application and uh, yeah against attackers and uh, attack factors 
That's excellent. That's excellent. And mo mo you know, <laughs> quite often you're, you're asked, okay, how do I implement this function in a secure manner? And here it is. You have examples there available for any developer. Exactly. And the cool thing is, so everything is on the GitHub in the markdown format. So <laughs> right. you know, if, if somebody isn't really happy with well, you know, the way we typed it or the comments or, you know, some could be uh, improved, please do. I mean, that's also the, the great thing about this, that everybody can see and can verify and can also help and adjust, right? That's right, yes. Um, yeah, so it's really open and it's not, uh, yeah, it's really transparent, right? So everybody uh, can, uh, can see and help and improve, so, yeah. Cool. Um, so basically, now I've seen uh, let you see the, the the code, yeah, the the reference. So the knowledge base items, the code examples. Um, like I said before, those are can be used when you have a specific question, like, oh yeah, how do I do this, or yeah. uh, what was it about this item, and then you can really specifically look that item up and have the correct uh, knowledge to uh, to do so. Um, but yeah, those are uh, one of the core functionality of the security knowledge framework. Uh, but the security knowledge framework has also two uh, uh, different functionality. Uh, okay. And I want to show that now. So sure. um, like I said before, the, the security knowledge framework was really created and built for uh, the developer. Um, and by that, we really want to uh, give the right knowledge and the right information to it. OK. Um, let me re-log in, because yeah. the, <laughs> the GitHub hook has been run. So uh, uh, a new installation has been put in. OK. Um, yeah, so like I said before, it was really for the developer to help him and you know, empower him to create better and secure code, and that is defensible. Um, so. As we saw it, we had two options. The first option that is in the pre-development phase, the phase where you're designing, the phase where you're having use cases and you know thinking about the functionality and the, the, the yeah how the user will use the, the application. Yes. Um, so for this, we have created the pre-development phase in the security knowledge framework, and that's uh, uh, something I want to show you right now. Um, so I'm clicking on Start New Project. Uh, well, project, let's call it like this. Create the project. Um, now we can select this project, and we can decide what we want to do. We want to add processing functions. So this is the pre-development phase. Uh, we can do the run checklist. That's the post-development phase. I will yeah, come on that a little later. So let's first zoom in on the pre-development phase. Um, as you can see here, you have the, the landing page where you can have example functions. So basically, this page will let you add all type of functions and functionality that you are, uh, want to create and thinking of in the designing phase. So to give an, uh, an example, we can say, well, we're now in the Sprint 2. And in Sprint 2, we want to do session management. and uh, also outputting uh, user information. So this is defining the security requirements for my own application, right? Exactly, yeah, because that is uh, what, it, what it will do. It will uh, give you an overview of all type of functionality you can use. So for example, user registration, because well, we're gonna do session management. We have forms, we're gonna have sessions, and we also want to output information, so uh, we also gonna use HTML. Right. Um, okay. Well, now we selected all the, the technology stacks we are gonna use, and we can say add values. Oh, okay. Ah. Um, so, that's maybe also funny to men mention. Um, we we are very strict in validating all the, <laughs> the information. Uh, and if it's not applicable according to our validation rule, it will it say will fail. <laughs> exactly. It will say not acceptable. And it will also raise a counter. 
So if I do multiple, um, yeah, uh, wrong uh, charities, uh, mm -hmm. my account will be locked out and I will be not denied access to the application. Right, right. So that right. wouldn't be cool <laughs> for the demo, but mm. the, just to, to, it is nice, uh, 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 well, it's not nice for us that we uh, missed the, uh, the, uh, the comma. Um, yeah. But again, it, it does show you how it's to punish proper validation. Exactly, <laughs> and punish him when he uh, and punish him, yeah, when he does so. So let me select again HTML uh, forms and sessions. Now I do add values. Okay. As you can see here, uh, we have the uh, function technology listed over here, and we can mm -hmm. remove or you know add another. Um, so when we're happy with this, and this is the functionality we want to implement in the next sprint, we say done. And now we can see over here the results of uh, the input. So and what did now just happen? What did happen is that we uh, correlate all the different type of technologies you could select in the pre-development phase. We right. correlate those to the knowledge base items it has, well, uh, items in there saying, hey, if you don't have this, then this is the attack factor. And again, this is the solution on how a developer should approach it. Right. Um, well, it gives all the items we selected. So for example, for sessions, well, it, there is not really one thing you can do, and then you can say, okay, I done my se session management. It's all secure, it's all locked down, it's all good. Well, for sessions, you really need a pattern. Uh, instead of, well, one thing you need to do. It's, uh, yeah, like an onion, right? There are multiple layers you need to defend and uh, uh, take control that it's correct. Um, to just give an example, uh, the session management control, the session cookies without the secure flag, without the HTTP only flag, the external session hijacking, those are all items uh, that you can again look up in the knowledge base that's saying, hey, this is the attack factor, this is what the attacker can, uh, can you know, do with this uh, issue, and yes. the solution on how the developers should, yeah, uh, mitigate it, and, uh, yeah, uh, how, how he should, you know, yeah, how he should mitigate it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, these are the security controls that should be in place in an application, and, you will get like a nicely sort of report being generated by the security knowledge framework yeah. that will show you what are the requirements. So then you could say to the developers, uh, guys, this is how we want our application to be developed. Exactly. Yeah, because that's also good to mention uh, while we are here um, in, in this phase, because in every um, development life cycle, uh, yeah, a company or persons should have defined a set of security requirements. Um, and this will help the developer already to define security requirements based on the functionality he wants to build. So the whole idea is when he's later and in, uh, in the stage of, of testing and pen testing and, you know, or delivering the code, uh, yes. Yeah, he, he doesn't get any surprises back or any structural issues that really could, uh, yeah, sure. uh, mess up his planning and, and release uh, yeah. of the product. Um, so yeah, so that's why we created the, the pre-development phase to, to make developers uh, already aware at the designing phase and take into the account of, yeah, all the extra steps and necessary uh, controls that needs to be there that's uh, correct. Uh, yeah, when dealing with the, this type of functionality, yeah. Yes, and then you have like a post-development phase, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, so let me go there. Uh, we can select the list projects. We just select the project we created earlier. Um, and now we have the post-development phase. Um, so in here, uh, this is the phase where the development has been done, uh, the design, everything, everything has been done. Um, and basically, now it's time to validate and verify that all security controls uh, are in place. Um, like I said before, to properly use this, and um, you know, you should first make a security requirement. Uh, and to be honest, I, I use the the, the OWASP uh, ASVS uh, for that. Uh, the application security verification yeah. project. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, and and um, yeah, uh, it depends on what type of information and, and things you are trying to protect. And uh, the ASVS will also uh, give you an overview on how to choose which type of level that is, you know, applicable for your type of web application. Right. Um, the most of the times I use the ASVS level three because that's the most advanced and for really critical uh, applications. Applications, yes. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I use this as a security requirement. Uh, so basically, the team, when they start developing, they already know the existence of the ASVS and the level three items. They use the security knowledge framework to assess it in the pre-development stage uh, right. and in, the, in the, the final checkup before delivering the code, before doing the pen test and all that stuff. We're going to use the post-development phase. And basically, what, what it does is, I will show you now, you can start and it will give an overview of all the uh, categories and all the security controls uh, in the ASVS uh, level one, two, two three. Um, and in here, I will go through the, the list together with the developers, um, right. like a sort of extreme programming uh, way, uh, yes. uh, and really go through them together and, and verify together that's been correctly implemented. Um, why do I do this and prefer to do this together? Uh, that is that, um, you know, my opinion is that the coder really has all the, the, the contact about mm. where the code is, how it's being built, what are the, the dependencies, all that jazz. He, yeah. he knows that best. Uh, and what I know best is how to abuse or attack functionality, right? Um, mm. So together, we're really looking at the code and really trying to see if the implementation of the items are, you know, being done correctly. Um, so basically, how it would go is like, uh, well, I say, like, verify all pages and resources require authentication, except those specifically intended to be public, the principle of complete mediation. Right. So he will then show me the code, give a, a speech about how it works, and I looking at him together through the code and validating what he thinks, you know, is correct. Um, and mm -hmm. together, we're looking at it. And well, when we see the evidence that has been correctly implemented, I don't see any attack factors anymore. Then I can say, well, this item, yes, this has been correctly being implemented. Right. And I will do that for all the items uh, <laughs> in the ASVS. Yes. Um, I must say, there are like pretty much there are around 160 items in there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, it would take me like a, a full day to do a full uh, level three code uh, checking, yeah. yeah, together with the team. But yeah. again, if I would do it on my own without the team uh, in a in a, an addict somewhere, in a, <laughs> you know, it will take me, f f yeah, far more time uh, because I miss context. I need to Definitely. see and understand, and so again, and, together and would it become like. Say you have the pre-development stage and then the post-development stage. If there is a mismatch between the pre-development requirements and the post-development um, checks, would that be highlighted? Um, no, no. It, it would be cool because, yeah, then you can also correlate from the previous to the next phase in your project. So that would be awesome. Right. Um, but no. Yeah, so the items that will fill should be like the same type of items that popped up in the pre-development phase. I understand. Um, but it is not really that, yeah, you have to make your, your own uh, uh, analyze and, and uh, verification to find that out. The application doesn't show uh, that to you. That, that's fine, that's fine. It was just a matter of understanding if they are linked. Um, but yeah, like you, you could run a, Post development, ASVS uh, run through with you know with the developers and trying to identify any gaps uh, as part of the development. Yes. Okay. Um, well, and and basically you do the whole uh, yeah the whole list so all the, yes. the 160 items. Yes. Um, and you can save the checklist. It will now uh, generate and correlate all the items to the security, uh, so to the knowledge base. 
So all yeah. the items in there from the AS3S, those are all, uh, can all be correlated to one of the items in the knowledge base. Uh, so that's where the, uh, the information is coming from. Um, let's see. So if you click one of the results, you can see here, this is yeah. the, the item that has been, um, uh, yeah, that was, you know, to verify. Uh, that's mm -hmm. also the item that is uh, mentioned in the ASVS. And in here, you can see in, uh, in what knowledge base item this item was correlated. So, and this right. one was correlated to m malicious intent. And for all the checklist items that is, uh, you know, in the ASVS, we can correlate those into, um, um, yeah, the knowledge base items and, you know, give a, a proper a description of the issue, the attack factor, and the solution on how a developer should approach it. Cool. Um, and and again, there, is a, there is another cool feature that you show me um, offline that was generating the report. So you're able to create a, a nicely done uh, word report that you could share with the project managers or development groups, right? Yes, that's uh, totally correct. Um, the cool thing is also that um, we are now also in the, uh, uh, the making of the, the whole framework as a service more. So you have a configuration and you also have user management in there. So you mm -hmm. really can separate also reports and projects uh, from other users. Based on users, okay. Excellent. Yeah, and that is uh, something we are uh, planning to um, uh, release I hope this early. week, next week, somewhere. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> will be released uh, uh, very soon. Excellent. Uh, let me move. Uh, don't know why it's like I said uh, earlier. Also, a thingy I have to look at because my um, Safari will make it in. Uh, <laughs> yes, the incorrect. Yeah. yeah. Incorrect file format, yes. Okay. So that, there it is. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be an example of, uh, yeah, the, the document that has been uh, created. So the use checklist, date, and the project name. Then we have, uh, well, the table of content. So yes. you see, a lot of the, the items are correlating to Who would the be the typical user of the yes. security knowledge framework. Yes. It's not always and the case, but yeah, some the, items the do have user, the same I uh, mitigation. Think and right. hope would be the developer, uh, right? So that is an, okay. uh, um, a table of I index. Mean, it's, it's and also here we have all the uh, yeah, yeah the knowledge empowering base empowering them, correlated them to the, the, the right set of knowledge uh, and, checklist and, and, and uh, uh, how yeah, to which level yeah, is. properly. So it's automatically populated. So you don't need to type any sort of report. You just select the requirements. So yeah, generate the report. It can, I think, maybe also on different levels. Yes, exactly. I mean, so the, the direction could say, hey, we have an awesome open source, open source tooling and, and guide uh, to help us implement security correctly, security sure. by design. Yes. Um, so from now on, we're only going to deliver code uh, based on the ASVS uh, checklist, and that can be level one, two, three. Um, yes. Every Depending application. On the yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, well, first have that consensus about, you know, in the company and among the, the people. And from there, then you, you really use, uh, well, the framework and set it up as a service in your company and, uh, well, guide people through it and say, hey, use the pre-development phase, use the post-development phase when you have the created the code, right? Uh, and also use the whole continuous integration on, uh, yeah, w what we showed before on, on uh, you know, the whole automated builds and yes. testing and validating. Yes. And I think the whole package together, well, it, it's helping everybody, right? I mean, the developer can create secure and better code. Um, management and everybody's happy because they deliver better code quality and, you know, it's also secure. Um, yes. Well, and, and the other, yeah, that, you know, better customer satisfaction, I mean, it's... it's you will see it, the, the quality, when you are using the, these type of methods and uh, principles, right? Yeah. So for, for all those development teams out there, uh, I will highly recommend you to visit uh, the Security Knowledge Framework uh, project. Um, the, 
it, it is an amazing uh, work, uh, Glenn, what you and your brother, and I imagine all the other volunteers are doing. Yeah. Uh, it seems that it's, it's quite active. You are making release <laughs> almost every week. Um, so yeah, it is amazing. Highly, you know, highly recommended to to check it out. Um, finally, I I imagine you're uh, going to Upseg USA, right? Yeah, that's uh, correct. I will be there uh, for the the summit also, um, and Excellent. with the uh, yeah overall security knowledge framework. So trying there to to see if we can improve, get some new ideas, maybe people on board helping. Um, so yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Make it big and uh, useful f for everybody, right? I mean, that's yeah. also uh, yeah why we started this. I mean, it is it is so hard, and and there isn't really a central place or person or you know that that's really um, verifying all this. I mean, OWASP yeah. of course is a really good uh, organization that already doing this, but mm. that's more focused, I think, personally on the attacking, right, and giving the means and explaining how attack factors work, and by that you also gain knowledge on how to prevent them. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You you are you are sort of bringing uh, tools. That will help you to to build security by design, uh, sure. which is a you know, uh, to my view, it is a, a a much more valuable approach to security. Um, well, yeah, it, it's more. It, it reminds me of uh, yeah the story, right? Uh, give a man a fish uh, a day, and uh, every day he has hunger, or <laughs> him out a fish, and uh, yeah, he's right. good for his whole life, and. That, that is something we try to achieve, well, at least for web application security uh, with this project. Mm. Um, that's why we are so well active on it and, and you know, giving workshops like uh, every two months or every month we have like two workshops we, we are giving um, and really spreading the word and, and, well, and the knowledge. I mean, everybody, you know, should be capable of, of well, defending themselves against automated attacks against elite hackers. Yes. I mean, it's, it's really, and it's also very important in the world and in the time we're living right now. Yes. As you see how, how exponential uh, the attacks are getting and, and how many yep. they are, it, it's really needed. So that's so why. The, there should be a stronger focus on building, you know, yeah, on the secure edit. systems, uh, you know, <laughs> that security is by design. Yeah, exactly. More in education than, you know, I mean, this is this project is the most, yeah, shortest feedback loop you can get, right? I mean, it's giving uh, exactly the sure. feedback needed on the right spot, on the right time uh, yes. to the developer. And, uh, yeah, in the end, he is, he is the, the, also the problem, you know, when creating issues or stuff like that, uh, yes. security vulnerability. So, yeah, empower them. Give them the right set of knowledge and, and methods and uh, that they can use to, well, you know, really create awesome code. I mean, Brilliant. on a functional <laughs> level, it is already awesome what, what yeah. people have built and create. But I would really see it also be secure. I mean, that that's... I love it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's now the difference. I mean... Yeah. Uh, you know, everybody can create or build applications, but to really make it a defensible and secure application, that's the new goal, the new challenge. Yes, it is. It is. Glenn, thank you so much. And thanks, Ricardo and the team uh, for this awesome tool. And again, anyone who wants to, you know, test it, it's out there. Just search for OS Security Knowledge Framework and play around. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Fabio, for having me. And uh, yeah, you know, I'm really appreciate it. And uh, well, I, I see you also in. Uh, yeah, see Pacific you at Absolute USA. <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> okay. Take care, Glenn. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>